Okay, so unit six is on gases, and these are 6.1 notes. So may, the main thing that we need to understand is what a gas is, because we're going to be talking about gases for so long, okay? So it, a gas, it's a state of matter. It's one of the three main states of matter, okay? If you include plasma, there would be four states of matter, but the, thing, the three main states of matter are gas, solid, and liquid. So the gas is one of them, okay? What are the, the characteristics or the features of gases? The ones that you see over here. So gases have mass, okay? That mass is going to be very small, but they still have mass, okay? Keep that in mind. The gases could be atoms or could be molecules, okay? You can have gases like helium, which is an atom, but you could have gases like oxygen, which is a diatomic molecule, okay? They tend to be nonpolar. So remember, to be nonpolar means that the difference in electronegativity between the two atoms in this bond over here, it's lower than 0.4, okay? If a, that is a diatomic molecule. They expand, they expand to fill the containers, meaning that, that whatever size of the container is, if you actually put a gas inside, the gas is going to expand, it's gonna get bigger until it fills the full entire container. Okay, they adapt to the size of the container. They could be compressed. To be compressed means that there is a lot of space between the molecules in the gas, okay? And because there's a lot of space between the molecules in the gas, compressing the gas means that we can actually reduce the volume of the gas. That is what compress means, okay? To reduce the volume because those particles that are so far away from each other can actually get closer. They form homogeneous or homogeneous mixtures, okay? That means that when we have gases and they, they mix with each other, okay? Different gases mixed with each other, these mixtures that they form are, we're unable to tell which part is which, that is homogeneous or homogeneous, okay? Gases diffuse, that's another um, characteristic of, fe of feature, okay? And to diffuse means to spread over a wide area, that is to diffuse, to spread over a wide area, wide area. They exert pressure, we're going to talk about how gases exert pressure, okay? To exert pressure is to exert a force per unit of area, okay? So if I'm pushing with my finger surface, I'm exerting pressure pressure on that surface. So gases and their molecules exert pressure. And they have relatively low density, okay? Keep in mind that the density, it's the mass over the volume. So having low density means that this ratio is small. Okay, and as we said, out of the three main states of matter, or if you want to include plasma four, gas, it's a state of matter. So we just explained the characteristics of gases. Now we're going to talk about the properties of the gases, okay? And to understand the properties of the gases, we're going to use a model, and that model is called the kinetic molecular theory, okay? So the kinetic molecular theory has four postulates. It has four important points that describes, again, the properties of gases, okay, of what we call ideal gases. Okay, so the first a postulate of the kinetic molecular theory says that gas particles are much smaller than the distance between them, okay? So this means that if this is a gas particle and this is another gas particle, the distance that separates these two gas particles is way higher than the size of the particle itself, okay? That says, or that means that the particles are negligibly, negligibly small, okay? That means that they're so small that they can almost, almost be ignored, okay? They're so teeny tiny that they can almost, almost be ignored. They're super small, okay? And those particles, as I said, are very far apart, apart from each other. So again, the distance between the particles is way higher than the size of the particle itself. That's the first postulate of the kinetic molecular theory that explains the properties of gases. The second postulate is that gas particles are not attracted to each other, okay? It's not like a positive and a negative ion that are attracting each other. There's no such force of attraction. So gas particles do not attract or repel, which would be the opposite, okay, each other. They don't, okay? What they do is they're in constant 
random motion. So they're moving all the time. That's why it's constant. And they don't follow any pattern. That's why it's random. Okay. And in that constant random motion, they have a lot and lots and lots of collisions. Okay. And those collisions are called elastic because when they collide, when the particles collide, they do not lose energy. Okay. They do not lose energy. And finally, the, the last postulate of the kinetic molecular theory, it's the number four, okay, which is that the kinetic energy, the average kinetic energy, remember the kinetic energy is the energy related to motion, okay, of a gas molecule is going to be directly proportional to the temperature, it's going to be directly proportional to the temperature of the gas, meaning that if the kinetic energy goes up, the temperature is going to go up in the same proportion or the opposite. If we raise the temperature of the gas, the kinetic energy of the particles in the gas are going to go up proportionally or the opposite. If the kinetic energy goes down, the temperature goes down proportionally or if the temperature goes down, the kinetic energy goes down. Okay, so these are the four postulates that describe the kinetic molecular theory, which again describes the properties of the gases. To understand gases and how they behave, we need to understand uh, the most important variables that actually describe their, the, the gases' behavior, okay? So those variables are important because they describe the gases' behavior, and the gas behaviors are described by what we call the gas laws, okay? All right, so as I just said, the gas laws describe the behavior of the gases, and there are some variables that are important to describe those laws, okay? What are those variables? The variables are going to be the temperature, the pressure, the volume, and the amount. If you understand what these four are, you're going to understand very well how gases behave, and therefore you're going to be able to describe all the gas laws. We're going to talk about the gas laws in the next unit, next set of notes very soon. Okay, so let's start with the temperature. Temperature is very common, right? So how do we represent the temperature with a symbol? Because we don't have to write the whole word temperature every time we talk about the temperature. With a symbol, we're going to use a capital T, as you see over here. How are we going to measure the temperature in science? Well, we're going to use a unit called Kelvin, and Kelvin is represented with the letter K. We're not going to be using Celsius or Fahrenheit. In science, we use Kelvin, and that's international. That means that in every single country of the world, if we're using Kelvin, every scientist, every person who's measuring temperature, from a scientific perspective, it's going to understand this measurement unit. Okay, so Kelvin is the international one. The second variable that is important to describe the gas laws and therefore the behavior of gases is the pressure. And the pressure is described or written with a symbol that is a P, a capital P. Okay, now to measure the pressure, yes, we do have multiple uh, units that we use in science internationally. Internationally, we have the atmospheres. We have the PSIs, okay, pounds per square inch. We have the mercury millimeters or millimeters of mercury. And then we have the tour, okay? We're going to talk about this very soon. Third variable that is super relevant to measure the behavior of gases and the, therefore describe the gas loss is the volume. And the volume is described with a symbol that is a capital V. Do not write a lowercase v because that would be velocity. So volume is a capital V. And the main unit that we use for volume is liters or any multiple of the liters. Okay, milliliters, deciliters, decaliters, etc. And finally, the uh, last variable that you, we need to learn to describe the behavior of gas is going to be the amount. Amount is represented with the symbol N and the unit for the amount is the mole. Okay, all right, so these four are super important that you understand what they mean. It's super important that you understand what symbol we use because we're going to be using multiple formulas. And when we use the formulas, we use the symbol, we don't use the word. And also, it's super important that you understand that each of these units corresponds to each of these variables so that you don't get confused later on when you use the formulas. Finally, there's one more thing that you need to know about this is the conversion from Celsius to Kelvin, okay? Many a times you will be given the temperature in Celsius and you will have to change it to Kelvin so that you can do math operations and apply the gas laws. So how do we change the temperature from Celsius to Kelvin? That's super easy. This is the formula, okay? If you're given the temperature in Kelvin, okay, 
you will have to find the Celsius. That's not the normal thing to happen. The normal thing to happen is that you're giving the temperature in Celsius and change it to Kelvin. But if you're giving it in Kelvin and you have to find Celsius, you will do Kelvin minus 273. And on the other hand, if you're given the temperature in Celsius and you have to find Kelvin, you will have to add 273 to that, okay? So whatever temperature you have in Celsius plus 273, that's the temperature in Kelvin. We just learned how the, four, the fourth postulate on the mo of the molecular kinetic molecular theory was relating kinetic energy and temperature, right? So that's what we're going to talk about right now. Okay, so the first thing, the, the first key word here or description is what is temperature? So the temperature, it's the measure of the average kinetic energy of the particles in the sample of matter, okay? So again, it is related to the kinetic energy of the particles that are moving in a sample of matter. In this case that we're talking about gases, the temperature, it's going to be the measure of the kinetic energy or average kinetic energy, and it's average because it's the kinetic energy of all the particles, okay, that form a sample of gas in this case. So what is the kinetic energy? The kinetic energy is, as we said before, it's the energy of motion. Okay, that is the type of energy that is, uh, the energy of motion is the, the kinetic energy, is the type of energy that is related to the motion of the particles. Okay, so we just said before that the kinetic energy and the temperature are directly proportional, meaning that when the kinetic energy goes up, the kinetic energy goes up or down, it doesn't matter, the temperature will go up or down proportionally. Oh, the same thing, when the temperature goes up or down, the kinetic energy will go up or down proportionally. All right, so you have two formulas here that actually relate the kinetic energy with the speed of the particles and the kinetic energy with the temperature of the particles. We're not going to use these formulas for mathematical purposes. It's more a conceptual thing that you need to understand. So the first formula tells you how the kinetic energy, it's related, related or directly proportional mathematically to the speed. This small v is speed, okay? This is the speed, this is the velocity, okay, of the particles of the gas, and it's a lowercase v. So as you can see here, this and this are directly proportional, meaning that if this one goes up or down, doesn't matter, this one is going to go up or down proportionally. So this means that when the kinetic energy is higher, the speed is higher, or better said, if the speed of the molecules is higher, the kinetic energy is higher. Now, the second formula, it's also a formula that is, is scientifically proven. It's a formula that explains how the kinetic energy is directly proportional to the temperature, okay? So when the kinetic energy is higher or lower, the temperature is going to go up or down proportionally. So summarizing the summary of everything, you have it down here. It's this one over here. The higher the temperature, the faster the molecules are moving and therefore the higher the kinetic energy, okay? So keep in mind that when we raise the temperature of a gas, we're talking about gases here, the speed of the particles is going to go up. This is a small v, so lowercase v, the speed of the molecules are going, is going to go up, or the particles is going to go up, and therefore the kinetic energy is going to go up proportionally. Same thing if it goes down, okay? When the temperature goes down, so when we are cooling down a gas, the speed of the particles will go down and therefore the kinetic energy is going to be lower. So kinetic energy and temperature are directly proportional. The relationship between the speed and the, of the particles and the kinetic energy and the temperature, it's very well explained with the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution, okay? The Maxwell-Boltzmann Maxwell distribution is this distribution that you see here, is this graph that you see here, and we're going to just learn how to interpret, okay? We're going to actually learn how to interpret two of these uh, distributions, two graphs, okay? The first one that you have here, it's this sample, number one, okay? And you need to keep in mind that you have the same gas, so this, this whole thing represents the same gas, at different temperatures, okay? So you have one same gas, doesn't matter which gas, okay? At different temperatures. In the temperature, remember, it's measured in Kelvin, okay? So when you see this case here, K, 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 and K, that means temperature in Kelvin, okay? So if you actually look at the distribution here, you need to understand what's going on. 
So this is measuring the speed of the particles that are moving, okay? And this is gonna tell you the probability to find the particles at different temperatures, okay? So as you can notice over here, the highest speed is here, lower speed is here, and the lowest speed is zero, right? Okay, and then with the probability also, we see that it goes in this direction. Okay, so what do we understand from this uh, Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution? What we understand is that obviously, though, as we said before, the kinetic energy, the kinetic energy and the speed of the particles is related. So the speed, if the kinetic energy is higher, is because the speed is higher. But the kinetic energy, it's directly proportional to the temperature of the particles. And we're going to see how. Okay, so as you can see here in this diagram, okay, which is your Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution, the highest speeds, okay, the highest speeds are going to be for those particles that have the highest temperature as well. If you actually look at this curve over here, the formerly red one, and everything that is underneath, you can see that it is the highest probability or the probability to find particles at higher speed when the temperature is higher is the highest, okay? The curve is way more displaced to the right than the rest of the curves. That means that a larger number of particles, okay, it's gonna have higher temperatures when the speed is higher, okay? If you actually go to the lower speeds, so you have a thousand, a meters per second over here, and you have zero meters per second here, you can see how when the temperatures are lower, like for example, over here, the probability to find particles at lower speeds is higher, okay? So this probability is very high to find particles at lower speeds when the temperature is lower. Summarizing, what is it that you need to understand from this Maxwell-Boltzmann's distribution? What you have over here, that the higher the temperature, the faster the gases move. As simple as that, okay? When the temperatures are higher, when the temperatures are higher, the kinetic energy of the gases is going to be higher, okay? And the opposite works as well. When the temperatures are lower, the kinetic energy of the gases is going to be lower, okay? And again, remember that this is a distribution for a sample of gas that is the same gas at different temperatures. Okay, higher temperatures, higher speeds, lower temperatures, lower speeds. All right, so there is a second Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution that I want you to interpret and learn, but this is for sample two. And in this case, sorry that I crossed that out. In this case, instead of having one single gas, we have different gases, okay? So we have different gases. The other case was one single gas. Now we have different gases. And we're going to see what happens to the speed of the gases based on its nature, okay, or based on how what happens to that, that gas specifically, okay? So this second case, as I said, is different gases at the same temperature, okay? And we're going to see that based on the nature of the gas, how the speed is going to vary, okay? But the temperature in this case is going to be kept constant. Temperature is constant. Okay, so if we actually look at the graph over here, I'm going to make this a little bigger. This is what happens in our a Maxwell Boltzmann distribution. We have different gases, oxygen, nitrogen, water vapor, helium, hydrogen. Okay, this is the molecular speed. And again, this is, this is going to be the fraction of the molecules that we see at each of the speeds. Okay, it's kind of the probability as we had before. So what do we see here? What we see here is that the fastest, this is the highest speed, right? And the, the speed is going in this direction. The fastest gas is going to be H2. And the slowest gas is going to be oxygen. So if you actually go to the periodic table and check out the molar mass of these gases, you will see how the molar mass of, of O2 is 32 grams per mole. If you check the molar mass of N2, you will see how the molar mass of N2 is going to be 28.02 grams per mole. If you check the molar mass of H2O, okay, 
if you add up the, the molar mass of the two hydrogens and one oxygen, that's going to be 18.02 grams per mole. And if you have the molar mass or you look at the molar mass of the helium, that's going to be 4 grams per mole. And then finally, if you look at the molar mass of the hydrogen, that's going to be H2, 2.02 grams per mole. So that's why I was talking about the nature of the gases before, okay, at the same temperature. In this case, we have different gases at the same temperature, and we're understanding what happens to their speed based on their nature, okay? So if you check this out, the molar mass of the hydrogen, it's 2.02, and the molar mass of the oxygen is 32. So obviously the hydrogen is a lighter gas. It has a lower, a lower molar mass, okay? So what you need to learn from here, from this Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution, is that at the same temperature, okay, all the gases are going to have the same average kinetic energy, okay? So same temperature, same average kinetic energy. However, however, if we have different gases, so we have a mixture of different gases, and each of those gases have different molar masses, the biggest molecules, so the ones that have the highest molar mass, are going to be the slowest gases. That's why oxygen, oxygen, it's moving at lower temperatures, oh, sorry, at lower speeds than hydrogen, that as you can see over here, it's moving at higher speeds, okay? So summarizing, gases, if they have lower molar masses, meaning they're lighter, they would be faster, okay? And gases, if they have higher molar masses, then they will be slower. This is the summary of this distribution. We've been talking about the relationship of the, of the temperature and the kinetic energy. That was one of the postulates of the kinetic molecular theory. Now we're going to talk about something else that the molecular theory says and, um, and also one of the main features of gases, that is pressure. Okay, so we learned before that gases exert pressure. Okay, and we're going to learn what that is. Okay, so pressure, which is represented with the letter P, capital P, is the force per unit area, okay, is the force per unit of area, okay? So gases, the molecules of the gases or the particles of the gases, they exert pressure, okay? And the reason why they exert pressure is because they collide, this is an important word, against surfaces, okay? So if I have a container here and I put a gas inside, the particles of the gas are going to be colliding against the surfaces of the gas, sorry, of the container, okay? And there's going to be collisions between each other going to bounce off. And also there's going to be collisions against the walls of the container. And that's going to create the that force per unit of area that is called the pressure, okay? All right, so that force per, per unit of area, this force over here, okay, it's determined by three things, okay? One of the things is going to be how fast the molecules of the gas are traveling. So the faster they move, the force that they exert will be higher, okay? The second thing is going to be the mass of the molecules. Remember that the speed of the molecules is gonna be um, changing based on the mass of the molecules. So depending on how the mass of the molecules is, that's going to affect the force that those molecules exert against the surface of the, of the container. Okay, and then the number of collisions. Okay, the increase of the number of collisions increases the, the, um, the pressure because it's related to how it increases the force. Okay, so again, pressure, it's going to be P. It's going to be explained as the force per unit of area. Okay, that pressure, it's related to the collisions of the particles, okay, against surfaces. And it's going to be determined, sorry, not, the, not only the pressure, but also the force is going to be determined by how fast the molecules move, by the mass of the molecules, and by the number of collisions that those molecules have. So to understand pressure and uh, pressure of gases better, let's answer the following question. It says, what are some ways you can increase the pressure of a gas inside a container? So let's say, for example, that we have a container that I'm going to draw over here. This is our container. And we have a gas inside, okay? So we want to find out different ways to increase the pressure of a gas inside a container. So the first way you can, or the, the, the first thing that you can do in order to increase the pressure of a gas in the container based on what we have just learned is you can actually increase the temperature. 
okay? Because if you increase the temperature of the gas in the container, and again, I'm following what we just learned, if you increase, number one, increase the temperature. So if we increase the temperature of um, the gas in the container, what's going to happen is that the kinetic molecular, uh, sorry, the kinetic energy of the molecules in the gas is going to go higher, okay? So the kinetic energy of the molecules in the gas is going to go higher, meaning that the speed of the molecules is going to go up. And this, if the speed of the molecules goes up, so if the, the, the molecules are going faster, that's going to increase the force per unit of area, right? So that's why the pressure is going to go up. So one thing that you can do definitely is you can raise the temperature of the gas. That would be raising the temperature of the gas. That would increase the kinetic energy of the particles and increasing the kinetic energy of the particles increases the force per unit of area. Therefore, it increases the pressure of the gas. Okay, all right, what else can we do? Another thing that we can do is we can add more gas. Remember, amount of gas is represented with N. So if we increase N, the amount of gas, there's gonna be more particles colliding here, and the more collisions we have, more collisions. And if we have more collisions, that means that the force per unit of area is gonna go up. So therefore the pressure is going to go up, okay? And the third thing that you could do is you can actually reduce the size of the container. So instead of like this, the same amount of gas, but in a smaller container. So if you have a smaller container with the same amount of gas, those particles are gonna be closer, okay? You'll reduce the volume. Those particles are going to be closer. So again, more collisions, more collisions, and if there's more collisions, the force of per unit of area increases, so therefore the pressure goes up. Okay, so summarizing three things that you can do in order to increase the pressure of the gas inside the container. You can raise the temperature, you can add more gas, or you can reduce the size of the container. All right, so how do we measure pressure? We mentioned that before as well. We measure pressure using different types of units, okay? So the different units actually have, there's equivalences between those units, okay? One thing that you need to remember is that when we are at sea level, the atmospheric pressure, so the pressure of the atmosphere on top of the surface of the earth, the atmospheric pressure, it's one ATM, okay? So why is this important? Because then we're gonna use the, the equivalences based on this number, okay? One atmosphere, which is again, the pressure of the atmosphere at the or, the, or the atmospheric pressure at sea level, one ATM is exactly the same thing as six, 760 mercury millimeters, which is exactly the same thing as 60, 760 torres, which is exactly the same thing as 29.9 mercury inches, which is exactly the same thing as 101.3 kph, which are kilopascals. And this is exactly the same thing as 14.7 psi. Okay, so all these units of measurement here, they are equivalent. They are equivalent, meaning that one of these equals one, like 760 of this or 760 of this, or each of these numbers are the same as one ATM, okay? So this means also that, for example, 14.7 PSI are the same as 760 tours, okay? That 101.3 kPas are exactly the same as 29.9 inches of mercury or mercury inches, okay? So all of these are equivalent. Why is it important that we understand that they are equivalent? Because we can use this as conversion factors to change from one unit of measurement to another one, okay? So if we want to change the units of the pressure from the ATMs to the torus, we're gonna use this equality here. If we're gonna be in changing the units of measurement of the pressure from KPS to PSI, we're going to be using this equality here, okay? So again, all of these are the same. So how do we measure pressure? So nowadays to measure the pressure is, it's we have way more sophisticated ways to do it and it's kind of easy just to go online or get in your phone or into any app that you can have and just check the atmospheric pressure, right? But back in the days, we used to use a device called a barometer Okay, and nowadays we use barometers as well. They're just more sophisticated than the one that I'm going to show you. I just want to explain to you how this uh, older barometer works 
because that explains very well what pressure is, okay? So what is atmospheric pressure? Atmospheric pressure is going to be the pressure that the atmosphere exerts against the surface of the Earth, okay? So that layer of gas that we have on top of our planet, okay, that's going to be exerting a pressure on the surface, and that's what we call the atmo atmospheric pressure. And remember that we said before how the atmospheric pressure at sea level when we are at sea level, the atmospheric pressure is 1 atm, okay? So 1 atm is the atmospheric pressure at sea level, and that's the same as 760 mercury millimeters, okay? All right, so as I said, you can just get online and you can check right now what's the pressure in Oak Park and what's the pressure in any, any part of the world, and it immediately will tell you, okay? Now, what is that device that I was talking about, the barometer? How do barometers work? Okay, so the barometer is kind of a pretty simple a device. It is a device that is filled with mercury. That's one of the things that you need to know that this liquid that you see here, this grayish liquid that you see there, it's mercury. Okay, so as you can see, it is a device that has a container. It's an open container, this one over here. And then it has a column of a that is filled with mercury as well that is an upside down column where this this side over here is open and this one over here is closed okay all right so when you when you actually put some mercury in the container what the container is going to do what the liquid in the container is going to do is it's going to go up right so that's why i'm going to erase all this that's why we have mercury not only in the area of the container but also here in the column because the mercury the the mercury liquid is going to just go up the column okay and fill it so how does the device work exactly so this is what happens when the atmosphere exerts a pressure okay on the liquid because this is the weight of the atmospheric pressure so when we this force is exerting a pressure down in this surface of the liquid what's going to happen is that the liquid this force is going to be transferred through the liquid and the liquid is going to move up, right? But at the same time, we have the weight of the mercury that is coming down because it has a weight because of the, the um, attraction of our planet, okay, because of, of the gravity, the, it's going to have a weight. So we're going to have two forces here balancing each other. We're going to have the force that is pushing up the mercury because, again, outside, we have the atmospheric pressure, and then at the same time, we have, we're going to have the force inside the column of mercury that is pushing down, okay? All right, so what's going to happen? That when these two forces balance, so the force going up and the force going down balance here in the column, when these two forces balance, we are going to be able to read the height of the mercury, and that height is going to tell us the pressure outside okay so if you take this barometer here to the sea level as i said before we said that at sea level the pressure is 1 atm right so if we if i actually take this barometer outside to the beach okay at sea level and i leave it, leave it there for a little while what's going to happen is that it's going to lift the liquid up which in this force going up is going to encounter, it's going to balance with the weight of the liquid itself. Okay, so at sea level, what I'm going to be reading in this height of this column, it's going to be 760 mercury millimeters because that is the pressure at sea level. Okay, so that's how the barometer works. This diagram that you have here is the same representation of the barometer, okay? So what you see is that you have the open a container. This is the atmospheric pressure pushing down, okay? And hold on, let me raise this over here. This is the atmospheric pressure pushing down, as I said. And then as you saw before, the force that is pushing down is going to transfer to the column and it's going to push the liquid up. But at the same time, because the column has its weight, okay, the, the liquid has its weight, there's going to be a force downwards. So when these two forces balance, we read the height of the mercury column. So this is new, That I, what I'm going to say next. The height of the mercury column in general is represented with the letter H, okay? So that's why you see H here. And as I said before, if you are at sea level, the height of the mercury column is going to be 760 mercury millimeters, okay, which is the same as 1 atm, etc. Okay, another thing that you need to know is that the, what you see at the top of the barometer, 
this over here is vacuum, okay? There's no air there, okay? It's vacuum, no air molecules there. So keep that in mind, okay? So remember how the two forces are balanced here and how when the forces are balanced, we can read the height of the mercury column. That's gonna tell us the pressure of the atmosphere. So far, we've been learning how to read the pressure of the atmosphere. Okay, how we can measure the pressure of the gas that we have, the air, that it's out there and it's exerting a pressure on top of the surface of the, of the earth. Now, we're going to learn how to measure the pressure of a gas that is confined. Okay, this is very different. A pressure of a confined gas means the pressure of a gas that is in a closed container. Okay, so a confined gas, don't get confused with what we were doing before, a confined gas it's the, the gas that is in a container, okay? That is to be confined, to be in a container. Okay, so how do we measure the pressure that we have a, of a gas that we have in a container of a confined gas? We use a device that is called a manometer or manometer, okay? Now, we have two types of manometers, okay? We have the open-end manometers, and then we have the closed-end ones, okay? So... What's the difference between them? Well, the difference is this word here that it says end, okay? The open end manometers are gonna be open in one end, like this one and this one, and the closed end manometers are gonna be closed in that end, okay? So this end over here for the closed end manometers is vacuum. For the open end manometers, this end here is open to the atmosphere. That is the main difference. Okay, so now let me explain the open end manometers first, okay? The first open end manometer that I'm going to explain is the, the first one to the left, this one over here, okay? This one here. So what you see in this manometer, it's that the pressure of the gas, which is all the way till down here, it's higher than the pressure of the atmosphere. And the reason why I know this is because the pressure of the atmosphere, as the arrows are indicating, it's in a higher position than the pressure of the gas. So the more you push down, the higher pressure, right? So what what is being pushed down here? What's being pushed down here is what you see in a grayish area that is the mercury itself, okay? So this is the mercury. And as you can see, the pressure of the gas over here, it's pushing down more than the pressure of the atmosphere. The barometric pressure is the pressure of the atmosphere. Okay, so when the pressure of the gas is higher than the pressure of the atmosphere, which is this first case here, pressure of the gas is higher than the pressure of the atmosphere, because again, it's pushing down more. The way you measure the pressure of the gas is the following. What you do is you take the pressure of the gas, it's always going to be in this area here, right? That's where the gas goes all the way till this point. So what ha happens pretty much? What happens is that I am not able to measure the pressure at this point. So what I do is I take this same height to the other side of the manometer and I, I, I put it here. Two heights at the same like level, so two points at the same height are going to have the same exact pressure on top. So what I'm going to do is instead of on the right-hand side, on the, I'm going to analyze the pressure on the left-hand side. So what is the pressure at this point over here? Okay, the pressure is going to be whatever this pressure is, okay, plus whatever this pressure is. So what is the pressure that is being exerted in this area? This is going to be the pressure of the mercury column that we have there. And what is the pressure that we're going to have up here? That is going to be the pressure of the atmosphere. Okay, so let me go over this again. If I want to write down or, or calculate the pressure of the gas at this point, because I'm incapable to find it over there, what I do is I take it to the other side of the manometer because two, two points that are the same height have the same pressure on top. So how do I measure the pressure here? I am going to be measuring whatever is on top of that point to understand what's the pressure at this point. So what is on top of that point? This area over here, which is going to be the mercury column, and then this other area over here that is going to be the pressure of the atmosphere. So that's why when the pressure of the gas is higher than the pressure of the atmosphere, to find the pressure of the gas, what you do is you add the height of the mercury column, okay, the height of the mercury column, height, remember, is H, and HG is mercury. So this is the height of the mercury column here, plus the pressure of the atmosphere that is exerting a pressure on top of the mercury column. Pressure of the atmosphere. 
okay? So that's the way I'm going to be able to find the pressure of the gas. Again, I'm gonna repeat this. The pressure of the gas at this point, it's taken to the other side, okay? And this side over here is where we're gonna analyze the pressure of the gas. So what is on top of this side? We have the pressure of the mercury column, so the height of the mercury column, and on top of the mercury column, we have the pressure of the atmosphere. That's why pressure of the gas. In this case, it's going to be the height of the mercury column plus the pressure of the atmosphere. Okay, so now we're gonna learn how to measure the pressure of the gas in an open end manometer, but when the pressure of the gas it's lower than the pressure of the atmosphere, okay? So when the pressure of the gas, it's lower than the pressure of the atmosphere, it's a little different. And I know again in this picture that the pressure of the gas, this picture over here, is lower than the pressure of the atmosphere because it's higher up. And if it is higher up, that means that there is less pressure on top of the surface pushing down, okay? All right, so again, keep in mind that this is the mercury, okay? And the, what you see in red is the pressure of the gas. When you see in blue, so this is the pressure of the gas and this is the pressure of the atmosphere that goes all the way down here. Okay, so now, how do I measure the pressure of the gas? How do I measure the pressure of the gas in this case? Again, because I'm incapable to measure the pressure of the gas on the right-hand side, okay, I'm not able to measure it here. What I'm going to do is I'm gonna take it to the other side of the manometer, so I'm gonna measure it here. So what's gonna be the pressure at this point over here? Well, keep in mind what you know. What is it that you know? You know that all the way down here, this is the pressure of the atmosphere. This is the barometric pressure, okay? And you also know that this part over here is going to be the height of the mercury column. So if I want to know the pressure at this point over here, I just need to take this whole thing and then subtract this part over here so that it takes me up here, okay? That's why the pressure of the gas, in this case, it's going to be the pressure of the atmosphere or the barometric pressure minus the height of the mercury column, okay? And again, it's because I want to know the pressure here, I take the pressure, the barometric, uh, barometric pressure, or the pressure of the atmosphere, minus the height of the mercury column, and that's going to give me the pressure of the gas at this point. Finally, we're gonna learn how to calculate the pressure of the manometer, or the gas inside the manometer, and or the, the pressure of the gas that is confined when we have a closed end manometer, okay? So when we have a closed end manometer, let me focus over here, it's going to be this case, this one here, okay? So actually, it, this is kind of easier. So you, you will have the gas pressure on the left-hand side, you see it in this picture. So this is the pressure of the gas that is going down here, and this is vacuum. Okay, so there's, that doesn't exert any pressure. So what's gonna happen is that in this case, the pressure of the gas, pressure of the gas here, it's gonna be the same as this, this side over here, which is going to be the height of the mercury column. So for the pressure of the gas, when they, we have a closed end manometer, pressure of the gas is going to be the same as the height of the mercury column. So what, whichever pressure this mercury exerts downwards, is going to be actually the same as the pressure of the gas there. And again, keep in mind that two points at the same height have the same pressure on top. That's why I can use this over here to represent the pressure of the gas on the other side, okay? All right, so this a representation that you see here, it's exactly the same thing that we have seen before. The first case, the first case that we have here, hold on, let me erase this. The, the first case that we see here, it's when the pressure of the gas, okay, the pressure of the gas is the same as the height of the mercury column, which is when we have a closed end manometer, okay? If the pressure of the gas goes all the way down here, the pressure is going to be the same at this other point, and that's why we know that the height of the mercury column, this height of the mercury column down here, is going to tell us the pressure of the gas. This is what I just explained. And then in these two cases, you have the open end manometers, okay? When you have the pressure of the gas that is higher than the pressure of the atmosphere, and you know again that because the pressure of the gas is going lower, this is the pressure of the gas, then in that case, remember that the pressure of the gas will be the pressure of the atmosphere plus the height of the mercury column because it's gonna be measured on this side and it's going to be the mercury column plus the height of the, sorry, uh, the pressure of the atmosphere. So the height of the mercury column plus the pressure of the atmosphere equals the pressure of the gas 
when the pressure of the gas is higher than the pressure of the atmosphere. And finally, the last case, it's going to be when you have pressure of gas lower than the pressure of the atmosphere. In that case, the pressure of the gas is going to be the same as the pressure of the atmosphere minus the height of the mercury column. Because the pressure of the gas goes here, if you take it to the other side, it's going to be the whole thing that you have here, which is the pressure of the atmosphere, minus this over here, which is the height. Okay, so pressure of the gas, it's going to be equal to the pressure of the atmosphere minus the height of the mercury column when the pressure of the gas is lower than the pressure of the atmosphere. So the problem of, com the, the, of conversion of pressure units here that we have says the atmospheric pressure in Santa Barbara is measured to be 15.4 PSA. So I'm going to write down what I read, okay, what I'm given. This is the given amount. This is what I start with. The question is, what is the pressure in TORS and ATMs? So what's the pressure in ATMs and TORS? Okay, so to make these conversions, you just need to use the equalities that we learned before between the different types of units of uh, pressure, okay? So for that, for example, one thing that you can do is you go ahead and divide this over one. Always do that with the first given amount to just make it look like a fraction. And then I'm going to change the PSAs to ATMs. So how do I change the PSAs to ATMs? Well, I need to remember that one ATM equals 14.7 PSI, okay? That's from before. We've learned that before. So I'm going to take this equality here. I'm going to put it in the form of a fraction so that I can cancel the PSAs and get the ATM. So I'm going to write the 14, the 14, sorry, 14.7 PSI here in the one ATM at the top. I go ahead and cancel the PSAs with the PSAs and I'm ready to calculate. So 15.4 divided by 14.7, that's equal to 1.047 ATMs. Okay. All right. So that's already done. Now, how do I change this to TORS? I can do multiple things. I can take the initial amount and change that to TORS using the equality between PSAs and TORS, or I can take this number here, the one that I just calculated and change ATMs to TORS. It doesn't really matter. So I take the 1.047 ATMs. I divide that over one, and then I multiply this by a fraction that is going to be the Equality between the ATMs and the TORS. And the ATMs and the TORS, remember, one ATM equals 760 TORS. Okay, so I cancel ATMs and ATMs, and the result here is going to be 769, sorry, 96, my bad, 796.19 TORS. And that would be the second answer. Again, you could have just taken the PSIs and change to TORS, looking at the equality between the PSIs and the TORS. So the following problem, it's again on conversions, and we have to do exactly the same thing. We need to do dimensional analysis, okay? So for this problem over here, we're going to do a couple of conversions, and we'll see how that goes. It says, the column of mercury in a barometer measures 743 millimeters. Okay, so this is the first tricky thing that you need to understand. If we are measuring in a barometer the column of mercury, okay, the, this is telling us that what we're reading in the, in the column is 743 millimeters of mercury, okay? So the first question says, what is the pressure in millimeters of mercury? Well, we already know it, okay? Because if the column of mercury, Hg, it's 743 millimeters, that's going to be 743 millimeters of mercury, okay? What would be that pressure in kPa's and mercury inches? So then, yes, we have to make the, the conversions here. Okay, so for the mercury inches, for example, we would take the 743 mercury millimeters. We divide this over one, and then remember what is the equivalence between the mercury inches and the mercury millimeters. So 760 mercury millimeters is the same as 29 0.9 mercury inches. Okay, so I cancel the mercury millimeters with the mercury millimeters, and that's going to give me the answer. And the answer is going to be 29.23 inches of mercury. Okay, now for the next conversion, it says that I have to change it to KPAs. So I take, again, you can start from the beginning or you can go from here. Now we're going to start from the beginning. It's the same. 743 mercury millimeters over one and then now i want to change them to kpa so what's the equivalence between the mercury millimeters and the 
KPAs, it's the following. Remember that 760 mercury millimeters, mercury millimeters, it's going to be the same as 101.3 KPAs. And if I cancel the mercury millimeters with the mercury millimeters, I get the kilopascals, the KPAs, and the answer here is going to be 99.03 KPAs. And that's the answer. So again, use the equalities that we learned before between the units of measurement for pressure and use them in di using, doing dimensional analysis to make the conversions. You put the unit that you want to cancel at the bottom and the unit that you want to get at the top. Okay, so the next problem, it's on a manometer, okay? So manometers, remember, are devices to use the pressure of the confined gas. So the pressure of a gas that is in a container, okay? So in this case, as you can see, the pressure of the gas is down here and the pressure of the atmosphere is up here. So the pressure of the gas it's higher than the pressure of the atmosphere. And again, it's because it's down below, okay? So what you're gonna do is you're gonna take the pressure of the gas, move it to the other side, so here. So this is what we're gonna analyze our pressure. So what's the pressure at this point? The pressure at this point is going to be this pressure here plus this pressure here. What is this? This is, I just erased it, but this is the height of the mercury column, okay? This is the height of the mercury column. What is this? That's the pressure of the atmosphere. So to measure the pressure of the gas here, the pressure of the gas is going to be the pressure of the atmosphere plus the height of the mercury column. So let's see what's the data that we have here. It says, what is the pressure of the gas if the atmospheric pressure is 765 mercury millimeters and the height of the mercury column is 80? So we just learned that we have to add them together. So the pressure of the gas, it's going to be 765 mercury millimeters plus 80 mercury millimeters, okay? And we add this together, and that's gonna give us a total of 845 mercury millimeters. The last section of these notes is on volume and amount, okay? And it's just it's to understand the stoichiometry for gases, okay? So volume and amount, so what's volume? Volume of a gas, that's what we're talking about here, is the amount of space that occupies the gas, okay? That's the volume. Keep in mind that to measure volume, we can use liters, milliliters, cubic centimeters, etc. The equivalence between a milliliter, one milliliter, and a cubic centimeter is this. It's the same. One milliliter and a cubic centimeter, it's the same. The equivalence between the milliliters and the liters is that 1,000 milliliters is one liter, okay? Now, the amount is measured in moles, as we said before, okay? So one thing that you need to learn that it's new here, and this is gonna be uh, showing up like plenty of times uh, in the following sections, it's that one mole of the gas at STP, which are standard temperature and pressure conditions, has a volume of 22.4 liters. Okay, so first of all, what is STP? STP is standard temperature and pressure conditions. STP, it's when the temperature of the gas is at 273 Kelvin and the pressure of the gas is at 1 atm. So what does this mean? It means that if I have the temperature and the pressure of the gas under these conditions here, okay, so if the pressure is 1 atm and the temperature is 273 Kelvin, one mole of that gas, regardless the gas, will have a volume of 22.4 liters. Let's do an example to understand this better, okay? It says, what is the volume of a gas if you have four grams of oxygen at STP? So remember, at STP conditions, STP conditions, so 273 Kelvin and 1 atm, one mole of a gas, one mole of a gas has a volume of 22.4 liters. So if we're given the grams of that gas, we just need to change those grams to moles, and then from the moles, we will find out how many liters that is, okay? So how do we do this? First of all, we're gonna find the molar mass of the oxygen, because if we have four grams of O2 and we divide this over one with the molar mass, we can change that to moles. So the molar mass of oxygen is 32 grams of O2 per one mole, that's the molar mass. In doing this conversion, we're gonna figure out the number of moles of gas we have, which is 0.0. 125 moles of O2. Okay, so if I know that one mole of O2 is 22.4 liters at STP, let's see how many liters is going to be 
one to five moles, okay? So how do I do this? I take the 0 0.125 moles, I do this over one to make it look like a fraction, and then I multiply this times a conversion factor that is gonna help me find the liters. What's the conversion factor? This one, one mole of gas equals 22.4 liters, because every one mole of gas at those conditions it's going to be 22.4 liters, okay? So I cancel the moles with the moles, and that's gonna give me a total of 2.8 liters of oxygen that we have with four grams of oxygen, okay? So again, remember, at STP conditions, these conditions here, one mole of any gas will occupy 22.4 liters, and that is used to do a stoichiometry as well. So let's do an stoichiometry problem with what we just learned, okay? So keep in mind that one mole of any gas, one mole of any gas at STP, one mole of any gas at STP is going to occupy 22.4 liters. Keep that in mind. Okay, so we have a, a chemical equation here. It says consider the following chemical equation. If you have 4.5 grams of methane, this is methane, okay, how many liters of carbon dioxide are produced at STP? Okay, so these are the two substances involved. So we're not going to involve any other substances. We are given 4.5 grams of methane. So that's going to be what we start with. Okay, that is going to be our starting point. So 4.5 grams of methane is 4.5 grams of CH4. I'm going to divide this over one. And what I'm going to do here is going to try to figure out how many moles of CO2 I have with this many grams of methane so that knowing that one mole of CO2 is 22.4 liters, therefore I can find the liters of CO2 with those many moles, okay? So again, first thing that I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try to figure out how many moles of CO2 I have if I start with 4.5 grams of methane. I do a stoichiometry, so I change first the grams of methane to moles of methane using the molar mass of methane, molar mass of methane which is 16.05 grams of methane. That's going to be one mole of methane. And then I'm gonna change the moles of methane to moles of CO2, okay? Because that is the, what it's, it matters to me here. That's what matters to me here, the moles of O2, CO2. So to change the moles of methane to moles of CO2, and two, we're gonna do the mole ratio. And because this equation is balanced, we can see how one mole of CH4, it's gonna form one mole of CO2. Okay, so now I can cancel the grams with the grams, the moles of CH4 with the moles of CH4, and I calculate here that I have 0 0.28 moles of CO2. So again, I did a stoichiometry as we have done in the past, okay? Starting with the grams of CH4 and going to the moles of CO2. And the reason why I do this is because I know that every one mole of CO2 is gonna be 22.4 liters. So with these many moles that I just calculated, let's see how many liters we have, okay? So I take the 0 0.28 moles of CO2, I divide this over one, and I know that every one mole of CO2 at STP conditions is gonna occupy 22.4 liters. So I make the conversion, I cancel the moles, and here I get that 6.28 liters of CO2 is the answer, okay? So this means that if I have a reaction with 4.5 grams of methane, the amount of CO2 that I'm going to be creating at the end in liters, the volume, it's gonna be 6.28, okay? This got erased, but it's going to be 